welcome to News Clicks show mapping fault lines where today we're once again going to be talking about the attack on Gaza, the assault on Gaza by Israel. The latest news, of course, is that a ceasefire has been declared after 11 days of intense bombing by Israel and counteractions by Hamas as well. The death toll has been quite horrific, over 230, the destruction of infrastructure, the injuries, the, the number of people that have been displaced, all this has been uh, substantial and it's going to take a lot of uh, resources, a lot of effort and time to rebuild for the Palestinian families which have been affected. So today we're going to be talking about the situation on the ground, the impact on the region and related issues. We have with us Prabir Purkayastha. Prabir, so uh, even last time we had talked about the possibility that, you know, how long would this conflict last because Israel clearly had some goals while entering this conflict and uh, it defied for a long time the calls for ceasefire by the international community. And of course, even some even calls for ceasefire by the U.S. So, how do we see the uh, accepting by the uh, accepting by Israel of this ceasefire right now at this point? So, in terms of what, how do we see the situation on the ground? You know, the key question always was: What was Israel going to invade Gaza militarily? And that is something that they it appeared at one point they were planning to do, but they somehow backed off. Now, did they? actually just make motions of doing it for some ulterior motives as a claim, or they were really in a, in a mood to attack Gaza and physically destroy parts of it, really increasing the slaughter much more. Or was it simply a ploy to keep the pressure on? We don't know. But the reality is that at the moment, Israel's ability to enter Gaza has decreased considerably. We saw that in 2014, that the first day they entered Gaza, they, suf they suffered, the military suffered serious losses. And that included senior commanding of of officers as well. So I think this has shown that increasingly physically entering Gaza is something that Israel cannot do. And that changes the military equation in, the, in, in this conflict. The second part, and again, that's a takeaway which the Hamas will uh, benefit from, is the fact that in the first time, the bubble of Tel Aviv was also threatened and the, the citizens had to scurry in their shelters. And this happened not only in Tel Aviv, but also in other major cities of Israel. So what was essentially a local phenomena limited to areas within say five to 10 kilometers of the Gaza border extended to the almost entire Israel and all its cities. So all of this shows that though it's an extremely asymmetric war, it's a, the damage, destruction, casualties are far more on the side of the, the Gazans than Israelis. The fact is that, that Gaza can inflict some damage, disrupt the normal life in Israel, itself makes it, you know, makes it not equal, but changes the equation in favor of Gaza. Now let's look at also the numbers. You're talking of really the, the, the best military in West Asia, supposedly, at least has the best arms, has nuclear weapons. It is refurbished every time it expenses munitions in Gaza by the United States immediately. They have offered 700 uh, odd million dollars of intelligent munitions, which is really precision munitions, so that it can attack uh, the AP buildings and the uh, Al Jazeera uh, you know, stations if they rebuild it over there. So all of this goes to show that the battle is really one-sided in, in terms of what the military power each side holds. But the fact that Gaza can inflict damage, they've increased their uh, range of their crude rockets, which are really pipes filled with some fuel and some munitions. But the range has increased. What was earlier about 10 to 15 kilometers now go over to about 200 to 250 kilometers. Now that's a huge change. If they can, if they can add intelligence to it, guided missiles, or even of a crude variety, that will also mean weakening the Iron Dome protection that Israel now has which gives it 90% uh, ability, ability to shoot down 90% of the missiles that are likely to land into in uh, populated areas. So the fact that Gaza can inflict damage, it's only 2 million population. Uh, it's, a, it's a small, packed, 
place where all the you know 50 percent unemployment destruction at a massive scale each time this kind of wars takes place but the fact that it can still inflict damage makes the makes it difficult for israel to do what it does in the west bank which is inflict uh, punishment on any population which is restive which wants to protest by destroying their homes putting the people in jail uh, battering them physically and so on it's completely one sided over there but the fact that there is some resistance over here in military terms means the equation has changed and each time that this conflict emerges again and again as it has now three times so if as it emerges again and again the equation will continue to change and i think that's something which makes hamas a much more important force in palestine and it's not just in gaza but also in the other occupied palestine territories and that equation means fatah which at least had the leading voice in the palestinian uh, community is now going to see a serious challenge from hamas a more militant challenge which will then force the equation to change also in the occupied west bank so i think this is not something which is changed in favor of uh, israel in fact each time the war erupts whatever uh, damage gaza or palestinians take i think equation changes in two ways one it changes in israel to the right which we now can see further and further but it's also changing the palestinian issues bringing forth palestinian issues to the fore and i think that's a very important change that we have to now recognize after this particular limited 11 day war absolutely prabir so in this context I also want to uh, take a look at the regional context because uh, we've seen quite a few developments over the past one one to two years we've seen the abraham, abraham accords where israel with the help of the us has signed deals with some of the countries the uae for instance uh, we have seen of course the consolidation of the us led alliance and uh, the israel saudi arabia egypt all these parties becoming much closer to each other so how do we see the regional situation in uh, after this conflict because egypt of course has been involved in the ceasefire but how do we see the role of the various players in the region see one thing is to recognize that the abraham accords are virtually dead it's not that united arab emirates and saudis were not playing footsie with israel for all this time they were so it was a physical open acceptance that we are in bed with israel that was the abraham accords but the fact that they also have to recognize that jerusalem is an issue that changing the demography of Jerusalem, attack on Al-Aqsa Mosque, Haram al-Sharif, uh, th those are things which none of these uh, countries can take uh, at, you know, and say, oh, that's okay, that's something to do with us. So I think that Abraham Accords will change uh, the record that uh, Israel is the dominant power in the area, can do what it pleases in Palestine, Palestinian question has, is now gone completely on the back burner. All of these things have changed also because of this limited engagement, war, whatever we want to call it in Gaza. So I think that is a major issue that how will the larger West Asian uh, map look like politically after this uh, limited war that is taking place in Gaza. And I think increasingly, the Palestinian question will not be on the back burner as it has been. And therefore, the, those who signed the Abraham Accords thinking that Palestine question is not going to be at the forefront and the Israelis are uh, able to handle it and therefore we can face a near normalcy and go ahead with what we are doing. I think that is going to come into question increasingly. Already we can see stirrings in Jordan have taken place before all of this. Now, how will it affect the population in the United Arab Emirates and Saudi, Saudi Arabia is a crucial issue. Now, United Arab Emirates doesn't have much population, so we can forget about that. But Saudis do. They have a fairly large population base. It's a large country. And it has a monarchy. It really does not have, it's not a nation in the strict, strict sense of the term because the people do not feel a part of the nation. It's really a 
princely uh, state. It's a kingdom of Saudi Arabia, as it calls itself, because it's the king who represents Saudi Arabia, not his people. So all these things are now possible that they will be in the mix. So what we see is increasingly that you will, you will see multipolar forces emerge in West Asia. You will see Turkey becoming a player, it already is. You will see Iran is a player, it already is. And of course, the Saudis and Emiratis are there. But you also have players like Qatar, and they, are, they represent Muslim Brotherhood, which again is what Turkey is, is at the moment. Turkey's Erdogan is essentially Muslim Brotherhood. So you have these forces in the region, which are not going to be led by one uh, hegemon as it was earlier, which was the United States. Right. So you are re increasingly going to see regional arrangements come in. And the fact that Egypt negotiated the ceasefire and not the United States. In fact, the United States' main role was to block any exactly. appeal from ceasefire coming from the United Nations. It calls the rule-based global order the world order. But here was the rule-based global order protagonist, supposedly, the United States, stopping a unanimous resolution in the United Nations Security Council by virtue of its veto. That was the threat, that if you try to move the resolution, I'll veto it. And they stopped it three times before finally Egypt negotiated unconditional ceasefire. So I think those are increasing signs that the United States sway in the region is going to decrease. Regional forces are going to come into the uh, forefront much more. Iran, Turkey are more important players in this. It's not just the Emiratis and the Saudis. And increasingly, you will see that the Palestinian question, the question of Jerusalem cannot be buried as it has been for years. And then on this, it's really the Palestinian population in occupied territories, including within Israel, that has brought this agenda back onto the table. Right. Thank you so much for talking to us. That's all we have time for today. Keep watching, Israel.